Hello, everyone. Come on in. Feel free to ask me any questions while we wait. We got about eight minutes before class starts, and I'm available for that. And of course, you're always welcome to stay late too. If you have questions. Mm, well, I'm hoping that means that you guys are rocking it and don't need any help. <clears throat> Come on in. So waiting at about uh, six more minutes. Again, anybody have any questions about any past material? Hopefully you noticed that I did change some of the dates for the MATLAB and Mastering Homeworks. Uh, you can always err on the side of those being the correct ones. So if you've got some uh, discrepancy between what's on Canvas and what's in my lab. Yeah. Unless my lab says something ridiculous like it was due last semester, then obviously my lab is, is dealing with the right date, okay? If it says something like last semester, that means your instructor's a goober and he forgot something. And if I find him, I'm going to have a strong word with him. <laughs> Professor, I had a quick question. Yeah, go for it, Aiden. Um, So, I guess... Are the tests, the, the online tests, are they, do we do them in class or are they just something we're supposed to do on our own? No, they're on your own. They're open book, open notes, uh, open internet. Uh, the only thing is you I average it a pretty short period of time. So hopefully you're not able to look up more than one. I mean, not from a, a I want you to get a bad grade standpoint, but from a, ideally, if you're looking up more than one, then you're probably not learning the material well enough to do well in the midterm. So that's right. I, I understand. Mean, and so right. that, that first test, I was just looking today. It, it's, it's closed out. Does that mean I, does that mean I missed it or does it, or is there, let me double check. Uh, and it's, it's the same thing with the practice test. I mean, if I missed it, it's whatever. Yeah. Um, that, that does mean you missed it if it's already closed. Uh, and I made some announcements about that, but uh, it, let me look. It might be something where I noticed that other people missed it. And if you're not the only one, then I'm more inclined to help you <laughs> by opening it back up. Uh, yes, it was closed last night at 11.59 p.m., as was the practice test. So uh, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, just because, you know, it's a tough semester, new stuff, that sort of thing. I'm going to go ahead and set that due date back a little further. I'll give you till Friday, and that's going to be the case with the test as well uh uh with the practice test as well so let me fix that real quick okay i appreciate it a lot no um, problem. yeah Everybody i just i, I guess i was just a little attempts. confused about that oh gotcha you're supposed to be allowed three attempts it looks like i didn't even allow that when i did it so it wasn't done correctly anyways uh so that makes me feel worse 
Uh, let me go ahead. I'm going to set it to the 12th, but just be advised uh, the next test is likely to be due by the 12th uh, or the 19th or something very close. So just be prepared for that. Uh, you are allowed multiple attempts. Evidently, it was set wrong. Oh, I see. I was looking at the I was looking at the practice test. That's why I only had uh, it had unlimited attempts. So I've set it to February 12th. Uh, the practice test is now set, and now I'm going to go set the actual test as well. And again, you'll have till 11.59 p.m. on, uh, I think I said it was the 12th. Yes, that's what I said. It was the 12th, uh, which is Sunday night. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it a lot. No problem. Try to keep up with that in the future, everybody, just to, you know, not get the... Uh, uh, not to get behind in the class, that sort of thing. So I've set this to 12th. And I tell you what I'll do, anyone that uh, has already taken it, uh, I will allow you an extra attempt if you're not happy with your grade. And that'll make up for the few students that hadn't taken it, getting the extra time. So if anybody's not happy with their grade, feel free to let me know. Uh, and I'll open it back up and let you have another attempt. And then I'll seem like it, that'll seem like it's, you know, fair for those who did it on time. Anything else? Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, watch out for that, guys. Uh, I try I try to put up a practice test, and when the practice test comes up, usually that means the regular test is going to be up within the next couple of days, and you're going to have somewhere between five and seven days to finish the test. So if you see a new practice test pop up, start looking for the regular tests and, and look for the due date. And the, the practice tests are always on Canvas. They're never on uh, my lab and mastering. We've still got a couple minutes for class starts. Does anyone have any other questions? Anyone wonder how I get my dome so shiny? <laughs> I use coconut oil today. <laughs> do, you, do you buff it out like with the, the car buffer? <laughs> no, but that is on my list of things to do. I actually told a dermatologist uh, there was a story where this dude got in a really bad, horrific motorcycle wreck, not wearing a helmet, and he like lost a lot of skin on here. And all of a sudden, when the skin healed over, he could grow hair again. So I told my dermatologist if I could grow hair again, I would put it against an angle grinder and just mold my whole skull. <laughs> <laughs> but he said that never panned out. So I guess I'll, I'll wait. And if I hear a second story, I'm just going to do it and not ask him. <laughs> right. Get a second opinion. Exactly. I miss my hair, man. It was never that good, to be honest with you. Even when I had hair, it was like really called fine hair. So like the hair follicles the, was very, very thin. And then I, I don't think the density was that high either. And I, I had cowlicks everywhere. So. Yeah, baldness, baldness runs in my family too, so I'm I'm worried for my future, but I'll enjoy my hair while I got it. <laughs> yeah, do do man, because all of a sudden it'll just disappear. My dad's still got most of his hair, and that kind of makes me mad. I want to kick him when he's not looking, but probably won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I saw an old man yesterday when I was getting my hair cut. He had more hair than me, but I felt good because I complimented him on on him and told him how angry I was. But it, his hearing aid wasn't in, so he didn't hear me. So that made me feel a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> at least you can, at least i can hear <laughs> right right exactly all right well time's up now i guess it's now officially class time so does anyone have any questions we're essentially finished completely with chapter three uh between the examples that i gave you here obviously there's examples in your book and then there's examples uh that i posted on canvas and if you just want to look through my YouTube channel, you'll you'll find a ton of lectures for 241. And, uh, uh, you know, you can look for the topics. And if they cover Newton's second law, then uh, they're probably relevant. So those are some more. I'm going to be making some more as well. Uh, but today we're finally going to start studying Newton's uh, laws of motion. And I'll sort of leave off most of the history. I'll just tell you some of the history, and that is that uh, Newton was born, uh, and his father either left when he was a, at a young age or, or left even before he uh, was born. I'm not not exactly sure. Can't remember on that 
Uh, I've only read like a couple biographies of his the most recent ones by James Gleck, and it's only about this thick. So it's like 90 to 120 pages, really good little uh, biography. And you learn a lot of neat stuff about him. So like one of the things he did is he drank mercury like every day of his adult life because he thought that it would uh, make him live longer. And uh, it turns out he ended up living like well into his 80s. So I, I, I'm not going to say that's due to the mercury, especially in light of us finding out that mercury is like kind of deadly and we don't want pregnant women eating seafood because of mercury. But that should make you feel a little better that maybe if I got a little mercury in me, it ain't, it ain't going to be, you know, it's not like a death sentence because uh, obviously Newton did it. Uh, not only that, it's actually kind of interesting. We've been able to track the trail of uh, Lewis and Clark, specifically from more or less fossilized poop with mercury in it. If you find fossilized poop with mercury in it out west, then you can be certain that was probably uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition, Meriwether Lewis and uh, William Clark, uh, because we know the Native Americans had not used mercury as an emetic yet. And that was what you do is basically if you drink bad water, you could use mercury as an emetic. Uh, so that's another thing that's been used for. But Newton was this, uh, well, he was shown to be quite bright. His father, I mean, his uh, uncle was a figure in the church, uncle, distant uncle or something, was a figure in the church and made a decent amount of money. And, and of course, would, would come and check, out, check in on the mother and Isaac. And the mother was running a small apple farm. And uh, he had been bringing young Isaac books and he was, you know, impressed with that Isaac's ability to read them and stuff like that. But then he took an interest in mathematics. So he would bring him mathematics books and then Isaac would finish like five or six of them in a week. And he was like, that, that, are you sure? I mean, he started looking at it and he realized that not only was Isaac figuring it out, but he was like uh, doing proofs for all these books. And these were like collegiate level uh, mathematics and stuff like that. So he told his told Newton's mother that he thought uh, Newton should go to Cambridge, and she said, "Well, you know, I can't afford that." And he said, "No, I'm, I'm willing to to pay his way. Newton's a, uh, Isaac's a very bright person, and uh, he needs to go to Cambridge." And then mom basically shook him down and said, "Well, I could not, you know, do without him here on the farm. So instead of Newton getting." enough money to go to Cambridge and not have to work a side job and all this stuff to pay for his meals. Mama took half of it. So for whatever reason, but that ended up resulting in poor Newton being the changer, uh, chamber pot cleaner for the wealthy kids. So he had to work his own meals off and uh, chamber pots like a porta john for your bedroom. If you're wealthy enough to have someone else that has to deal with the after effects of said porta john and cleaning it up and stuff then uh, you think you're pretty awesome because you can just sit in your room and poop or whatever. But anyways, so people picked on Newton for that. That didn't work so well. Newton turned out to be a quite thin-skinned person, but very brilliant. Uh, and he was very pious. Uh, he bragged about at the ripe old age of 80 that he was uh, still a virgin, uh, which uh, as a devout Christian, he he took that as a great set of, of pride. In fact, he he read and wrote a lot on the Bible. I think he wrote some 300,000 words on the Bible, uh, maybe about half a billion words on the Bible because he was reading the New Testament and Greek and specifically reading it, trying to uh, trying to find hidden numbers that might help him find the fountain of youth or something along those lines. He was also an alchemist, so he believed in trying to turn mercury into gold, which by the way, we can do now. It's just not cost effective, so we don't bother anymore. Uh, and uh, even though he had this real pious streak, we were really curious because we finally found his notebook, which is his personal notebook. And, and everybody at that time had their own personal notebook. Uh, and they, uh, the brilliant ones always hit it. Like they had made up some kind of code that would break however they wrote it. And you had to find the primer. If you found the, huh. if you found the primer, then you could break the code. And and sure enough, we found the primer for Newtons, and everybody was super excited. And you go for like you know fifty pages straight, and it's nothing but forgive me, Lord, for today is the Lord's day, and I worked. Or forgive me, Lord, for today I uh, used your name in vain. And it's like hundreds and hundreds of pages, nothing like that. And all of a sudden, you run into this one page that says, "Forgive me, Lord, for today I wished the death of fifty people." <laughs> So he had a weird streak in him, 
But anyways, one of the things he did do also is he studied optics. He wrote several hundred thousand words on optics. And he was, for instance, trying to figure out how the shape of the eyeball could affect vision. So he just pried his eyelid out sort of like this and then jabbed a knitting needle in there and tried it and pushed it and stuff like that and drew in his notebook what he saw. And if you look at the pictures, you're like, oh, yeah, I see where he saw that. It was like lightning bolt shooting out of this dimple in his eyeball. Uh, he would stare at the sun uh, for as long as he could bear it. And it got so bad that one time he had to spend like over 30 days in his house with the blinds drawn because he developed a horrible headache uh, from looking at the sun too long. <sighs> and he kept seeing spots before his eyes and stuff like that. But either way. Uh, he was at Cambridge, and they sent him home for the plague, uh, basically because, you know, they didn't know much about the plague, but they did know that if you were in a, a place that was densely populated, you were more likely to get it. So they sent him home for a little while, and Newton went home and, of course, started inventing calculus, started to uh, write the laws of physics as we now know them. And, you know, you've probably heard him say, if I've seen further than others, it's only because I should, stood on the shoulders of giants, which sounds like a super humble thing. And if anybody knows anything about Newton, he's sort of the antithesis of humble. Uh, and for good reason, he's likely uh, probably among the top 100 people intelligence wise to ever live. If, I mean, it's really that, that high a level. So it's pretty impressive. But the backside of that story or the backstory on that uh, issue was that was said at the Royal Society, uh, of whom are uh, of which the president was a guy by the name of Robert Hooke, who was one of Newton's you know mortal enemies. In fact, he's almost certainly one of the people on that list of 50 he wished to die. Uh, but he was the current president of the of the Royal Society. Mm. And he was in, uh, in presence there. So what he's saying is that if I have seen further than others, it's only because I stood on the shoulders of giants, not short little hobbits like you, Mr. Hook, who can't even reach five foot tall. Uh, so uh, we think, in fact, that uh, Robert Hook might have been on the order of 410, 48, uh, something like that. So he was really a short guy. And he was very, very sensitive about it. He was a good scientist, so he just, you know, it's kind of hard to be a good scientist when uh, the people you're hanging out with are Edmund Haley, uh, who Haley's Comet's named after, even though he didn't really discover it, and Isaac Newton and Leibniz and, and all these really wonderful minds that exist. It's hard to show out, up uh, everybody else. So there was some issues, one of which was, for instance, the, the guys... Edmund Haley and some other people, including Mr. Hook, were at a, a pub one night talking about uh, the laws of physics, basically, and wondering if you had a one over R squared force law, what kind of orbit could you get? Ooh, I'm sorry, I keep yawning. I can't stop. Uh, well, Robert Hook said, oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I know that answer. I've, I worked that some time ago. So they they asked him for it. And he says, well, I'll, I'll find it and bring it to you. And never showed up. So they went to his house and he couldn't find it there. And then uh, he said, no, never mind. I'll just do it again and bring it to you. Like, OK, so they gave him several weeks and that, that never happened. Uh, so they really started to wonder whether he'd done it at all. In the meantime, Haley goes over to Newton's. Uh, uh, and visiting him and tells them about the scenario. And, and Newton says, oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's, there's only two laws, in fact, uh, force laws that provide for a closed orbit. And that is uh, F equals some constant times X, which we now know as Hooke's law. And F is proportional to one over R squared. And in fact, in both of those cases, the orbits are uh, uh, conic sections. So you can get hyperbolas, parabolas, ellipses, and circles, and that's pretty much all you can do, and they're only closed for those very specific forces, and he says, oh, really, could you show it to me? He said, yes, and he starts looking through his notebooks, and he just can't find it. He said, never mind, I'll do it again, and literally gives it to him, like, within the next day, so uh, that was one of the things that ticked off Hook, and it made Hook uh, claim that Newton had stole his information, and, and uh, most people doubt that that part was stolen. Uh, Leibniz is said to have stolen the calculus from, I think, the latest scientific and historical 
uh background of that is probably leaving it did steal it uh whether he stole it knowingly or not not really sure but probably he did specifically they had a common acquaintance that common acquaintance visited newton uh newton had recorded in fact speaking with that acquaintance and talking to him about his system of fluxions which is what he called his calculus and literally like the next day he goes and talks to Leibniz and shortly thereafter Leibniz publishes a version of the calculus that looks so pristine and perfect it's like like you've been working with it for years that's normally the hallmark of someone who stole it from someone else because if you know where your results going to end up you're more likely to use smarter symbology and stuff so uh this is probably a pretty good idea to believe that Leibniz uh did not invent calculus or he co-invented it but uh probably had a little bit of probing and extra help uh by the fact that he was privy to some Newton's information so anyways they are some weird people uh you got to be careful looking at the history and not kind kind of using an analysis that's not consistent with the time anachronistic analysis uh is what i call it uh you don't use today's standards to judge people you know hundreds of years ago for obvious reasons uh in some sense you do but really it, it you know it takes a little bit of development human humanely to get where you're at so anyways what newton did come up with was in fact uh, his Principia. He wrote it as uh, the Principia, which you'll notice is in Latin, and of course there are no soft C's in Latin, so it's called a Principia as opposed to Principia. But basically, it's a tome written in Latin. It's huge and thick, and it's got a lot of geometric figures in it. And he basically codifies three specific laws and and. Uh, makes use of calculus and and introduces a law of gravity, uh, explains why there's tides, he explains why uh, the earth is processing, I, I, if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure that was one of the topics covered, uh, I think it was, can't, can't remember, uh, but anyways, he had a lot of stuff in there, and there was some truth to him saying, if I have seen further than others, only because I stood on the shoulders of giants, because as I mentioned to you guys before, Galileo had already came up with what we call Galileo's law of inertia uh, by, you know, rolling balls down inclines, he saw they sped up, rolling them up inclines, he saw they slowed down. So he reasoned that if they were perfectly horizontal, they would never speed up or slow down. Uh, and then he just sort of said, it's as if an object has an inertia, some reluctance to change its motion. And that's what objects do naturally, as opposed to going to a stop. <laughs> Now, that was in stark contrast to what Aristotle had taught, so it was a, sort of a big deal. But you can see that, that that is essentially Newton's first law of motion, which we can word it in a couple of ways. One way is the, uh, an object in motion tends to stay in that state of motion unless acted upon by a net external force. Okay, uh, I added some extra words there. I could shorten it a little bit by saying an object will maintain a constant velocity unless there's a net external force acting on it other than zero okay so velocity remember has a magnitude and direction and what we're saying is neither the magnitude nor the direction of the velocity will change if the net force if you're summing up everything that's applying a force to this object and it's all the other things applying a force not it applying it to itself if you just take all the forces that are acting on the object add them all up and you get that it's a net zero force then that thing should have a constant velocity period if it happens to be a zero velocity that's okay too it'll just sit perfectly still if it happens to have a velocity of 60 miles per hour going 15 degrees east of north and three degrees above horizon uh, above her, uh, horizontal then it should do that forever of course, if you're on the earth and you know that gravity is going to tend to pull it, so that's probably a force. But the main thing is that's Newton's first law of motion. Uh, an object in motion tends to stay in that state of motion unless acted upon by a net external force. Uh, so we see that's already Galileo's. And in fact, I was telling a student, uh, I was lucky enough to be in Salt Lake City a couple of years ago, pre, pre COVID, and I got to go to a Louis, Leonardo da Vinci uh exhibit and in looking at one of his actual notebooks you could read that he said it is obvious that if a eagle pushes down on the wind with his wings with a force of 50 pounds something equivalent to that 
then it is obvious that the wind should respond by pushing up on the eagle's wings with a, with a force of 50 pounds as well. So there's Leonardo da Vinci talking about what we now know as Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction, which I normally state is something like F12, which means the force of vector quantity on object one, that's the first subscript, as a result of object two, that's the second subscript, so F vector one sub one two is equal to the negative of f vector sub two one meaning if object two is applying a force to object one and it's called f one two then object uh, one will be applying a force to object two and that force is in fact the negative of f one two and it's called f two one okay so that's another way of saying it but basically uh, I've heard phrases such as you can't touch without being touched uh, for every action. There's equal but opposite reaction. Uh, I like to tell it this way. Uh, in high school, went to a lot of parties. There was obviously people that would get in fights and inevitably there was some goober, some dude would you know think he's cool and punch a wall or a windshield or a window and it would break and all that stuff. And you see the you know, guy come to school the next day or the Monday or something that you've got broken fingers. Because it turns out that, that uh, even if you are strong enough to break a wall, say it takes you know 500 newtons, and by the way, the newton is the unit we use for force in the SI, but say it takes 500 newtons of force to break a wall, even if you can develop that much force in a punch, uh, which is around 125 pounds, uh, that doesn't mean that you get to punch the wall with no repercussions. In fact, if it takes a, a, a uh, 500 newtons to bust a wall and you punch it and bust the wall what that means is you applied a force of 500 newtons or more to the wall and whatever force you applied to that wall even though the wall break uh breaks that wall applied the exact same force to your knuckles okay no ifs ands or buts about it the neat thing about it is it also gives us some insight into things like have you ever, if you've ever tried to kill, say, a mosquito or a fly, a house fly, say, with just your hand, it's really, really hard. I, I've tried. I've been, I put a lot of work into this, just, you know, goofy things you do when you're bored or whatever. But, you know, I've tried getting my hand to go as fast as possible to hit them and stuff like that. Turns out it's just really hard to do it. And the reason why, one reason you can think about it, why, is sort of Newton's third law. On a superficial level, you can say it sort of makes sense that I can't put a big enough force on a fly to kill it because the force that the fly could apply to me is not very big. And if the fly can't apply a very big force to me, probably it can't supply a big enough force to kill itself. That's a very superficial way of stating it, but it is right. If you want to go through the actual analysis and think about what's happening, imagine me as uh, as talented, say, as the University of or the yeah the University of Tennessee baseball pitcher I saw some time ago who was pitching well in excess of 100 miles per hour. I think he even had one at like 105 miles per hour. If you can pitch a baseball at 105 miles per hour, that means your hand at the very minimum must be reaching 105 miles per hour or very very close to it at the uh just before it releases the ball now the ball will speed up a little bit because it's going downhill but not very much because the time is so limited in between the stride of the pitcher and the and getting to the catcher but the main thing is if your hand could move 105 miles per hour then in principle you could use that same motion like a like a serve in tennis say or like a throw, you could use that same motion to hit a fly. Now, what happens when you do that? Well, you hit a fly and the fly does this number. Basically, if it's sitting perfectly still, there's going to be some period of time during which the contact of your hand and the fly is going to require the fly to be lifted from zero miles per hour up to 105 miles per hour. And that should be a fairly small amount of time, maybe a tenth of a second, maybe a hundredth of a second. I'm not really sure. But the main thing is it'll obviously be a short period of time because it doesn't take long for my hand 
uh, to bring a fly up to 105 miles per hour and the fly being insignificant compared to my hand, it's not going to slow my hand down very much. But here's the deal. You could calculate that, that acceleration. It would be 105 miles per hour minus zero miles per hour divided by the time taken, and that would give you an acceleration. According to Newton's second law, though, the total force you'd have to apply to that fly to make it accelerate at that rate A is that total force equals to M times A. Well, if that force is say a thousand Newtons, wow, oh man, I gotta, I gotta do a thousand Newtons up against the fly. Uh, what you gotta realize, or excuse me, if, if that acceleration, let's say the acceleration was something like 10 or 20 meters per second every second. If that was really the case, you might think, well, that's horrible. But then you remember, wait a second, the force required to bring it up that acceleration is just equal to the mass times that acceleration. So if the acceleration was 10 or 20, the mass of the fly might be a milligram or a few milligrams or maybe a, a whole gram. Well, that's a whole thousandth of a kilogram. Therefore, you're going to take that 20 kilometers or meters per second per second and multiply that by one one thousand. And the force is, in fact, quite small. So basically, it's hard to kill a fly out in the open uh, with a fast hand, specifically because the fly's mass is so small, it doesn't take a very large force to bring them up to as fast as your hand's going. Now, you can extend the speed by, instead of using your hand like this, you can actually use a fly swatter, and then you've got a, a, a arm or a lever arm, if you will, that's the length of your arm plus another couple of feet for the, for the fly swatter. That could cause the actual speed to be such a great factor over 100 that it might be able to bring it up enough force to even kill it in the air. But in reality, we generally use fly swatters to kill flies uh, on, sub on surfaces, like if they're on the wall or a table or something like that, then we're squishing them between something. That's like double the force. So that's why those are pretty easy to kill. Okay. So yeah, it is really hard to do stuff like punch a, a little sheet of tissue paper uh, because it's such a low weight, a low mass. It doesn't require much force to accelerate it. Now, that's the endpoints. That's Newton's first law of motion, Newton's second law of motion. There's Newton's second law, or excuse me, third law of motion. Now there's Newton's second law of motion that I want to cover as well. And that's the uh, one of the more mathematical ones, even though I did give you an expression for uh, Newton's third law in, in a mathematical format. Namely, I said that F12 equals negative uh, F21. Uh, with vector symbols over them. That is a mathematical version of Newton's third law. But Newton's second law is, is where, you, where the first law ends. So the first law says, hey, whatever velocity you have, and I'm using the word velocity on purpose here because it's not only the magnitude of how fast you're going, it's also the direction you're going. Neither of those will change unless the net force acting on the object is not zero. If it is zero, then that's not going to change at all and everything's good. But what happens if it's not zero? Well, we know from Newton's first law is that the velocity is going to change, but we don't know anything beyond that. We just know it's going to change. Well, that's where Newton's second law comes in. And Newton's second law is probably the second most famous equation uh, in the whole world. The first being, see if y'all can finish this for me, E equals mc squared exactly that's the that's probably the number one most famous equation and it's an important equation that equation allowed us to explain for instance uh how the sun could possibly have lived for maybe fifty thousand years that ancient biologists were thinking the earth might be uh age-wise right ultimately we've now figured out that it has to be several billion in fact on the order of five billion years old and it's E equals MC squared that helped us understand that. So yeah, that's a very big equation. The other one though is F equals MA and, and that's really a far distant second equation, but I've seen it like on ASICs commercials for tennis shoes. I've seen it on Nike commercials. I've seen it on just football commercials, all sorts of stuff like that. So F equals MA is a pretty common one. So I'm not gonna take the time to write out Newton's first law and Newton's third law, but I, t I, uh, I will with Newton's second law, 
Uh, but I will tell you guys that one of the fundamental ideas in, in a physics class is, hey, if you've got a couple of chapters named after some laws or even one chapter named after a law, you probably need to commit that to memory, not only the law itself, but what the numbers are. So it's not unreasonable for me to ask you, and this is not something you can have written on your uh, equation sheet, but it's not unreasonable for me to ask you to state Newton's three laws of motion and in order and tell me which is which, right? So I don't mind you having F12 equals negative F21, but I do mind you having that on your equation sheet and then writing next to it third or three or third law or something like that. Uh, I do mind you having, I don't mind you having F equals MA on your equation sheet, but I do mind you having that that's the second law. So don't put those things on your equation sheet. Uh, the only thing I really allow you in terms of words is you can say where M is the mass or where A is the acceleration or F is the total force. Those are kind of things I allow, but that's pretty much it. So let me start by sharing my screen on my iPad. Okay, it looks like it's working this time. All right, so first thing I'm going to show you is what I told you uh was newton's third law so we actually have newton's first law and i said i wasn't going to write it but let's see i might end up writing it anyways newton's first law it basically says uh if the net force, which I'm going to write like this, is equal to zero, then V equals a constant. That's probably the shortest way I could write Newton's first law. If the, and notice I wrote a summation, that's, that sigma there means add up all the forces acting on it. Every darn one of them, okay? Add up all the forces acting up on uh, acting on it and only count the forces of other objects act, acting on it. That's why I wrote external. Uh, for instance, if you've heard Andrew Jackson, you've heard of, you know, lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. You can't do that. So uh, an object cannot apply a force to itself. And that sounds stupid, like you would never do that. But what I mean by that is if you treat, say, a kid riding in a wagon along with the wagon as the thing obeying F equals MA, then uh, you can't take into account the force that the, the kid in the wagon applies to the wagon because he's part of the system. Okay. So that would be an internal force. So that's what I mean by that. It's not me trying to trick you up. Okay. So that's Newton's first law. Newton's second law Uh, I like to write this way, and actually, I hate what I did with that in there, so I'm going to kill that. Uh, I like to write it this way. I say that A, a vector quantity, is equal to the total external force acting on a body divided by mass. Now, don't get scared by the mass being divided by because the one thing I'm certain you haven't learned anything about is division of vectors, okay? Uh, all this means in this case is you're multiplying the vector summation of the forces external. That's a vector quantity. You're multiplying it by the reciprocal of the mass. So it's, you know, if the mass was 100 kilograms, then you're going to multiply this by 0 0.01 kilograms to the negative one power. So that's all that is. But what this tells you is that if the total force goes up by a factor of two, then the acceleration goes up by a factor of two. Okay, if it goes down by a factor of 
then you're basically going to decrease the acceleration by a factor of 3.8. The other thing it says is that uh, the mass, if the mass goes up by a fa factor of seven, then the acceleration with everything else being the same is going to go down by a factor of seven because they are thumbs up, thumbs down. So the total force and the acceleration, thumbs up, thumbs up. The acceleration and the mass, thumbs up, thumbs down. So again, if, uh, if you want to talk about changing the mass, if you increase the mass, you decrease the acceleration, which is why softball is a little safer than baseball. A softball is a little heavier than baseball. It's also a little bigger, so it has more air resistance, that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing that this equation says, now, when Newton was uh, inventing the calculus, he really didn't have this concept of a vector yet. So he explained his law as an object will receive an acceleration A that is directly proportional to the sum of all the forces acting on it and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. And he would say the acceleration is, in fact, parallel to the total force acting on it. So when you add up all those forces vectorially, you're going to get a vector that has a magnitude and direction. And what Newton's saying is that magnitude and direction, if you divide the magnitude by the mass, you get the magnitude and the acceleration. And the direction of the force is, in fact, going to be exactly the same as the direction of the acceleration. Okay, so that's Newton's uh, second law. And then finally, Newton's third law. That's the one where they normally say for every action, there's an equal but opposite re reaction. Uh, I like to write it just like this. And this means the force on object one as a result of object two is equal to the negative of the force on object two as a result of object one, okay? So you, what you need to think about is uh, the force pairs. So for instance, if someone kicks a, uh, kicks a soccer ball and applies a 300 Newton force to it, then what's going to be the other force reaction, reaction, action component? So you kick a ball with a force of 300 Newtons what is the ball going to apply a force of 300 newtons to foot your foot right uh what about when the earth pulls down on me with a force of 260 pounds what am i applying a force of 260 pounds to you're pulling the earth up with a force of 260 pounds Yep, exactly right. I did not expect you to get that. Good job. Yeah, I'm pulling up on the earth. Now, the earth is kind of heavy, even compared to me, so it's not going to move much, but that's what's happening. So that's your action-reaction pairs, and that's the kind of stuff they want you, to, uh, want you to think about. Now, just for the record, we can see that the unit of mass, we know that's the kilogram, so I'll, I'll just write one kilogram for that. The unit of acceleration don't even worry about the vector symbol yet. We know that that is one meter per second every second, which is actually the same thing as meter per second squared, except I like saying it as meters per second per second. And then from F equals MA, and notice how I write the sigma here. I'm always going to write that sigma because I, I want you to remember that, hey, I can't just take any force and put it on the left-hand side of, of Newton's second law. I have to add up all the forces, and only then uh, can I put it uh, equal to m times a, okay? Well, because of that, we see that the units of force must be equal to a kilogram times a meter per second squared, which equals one kilogram meter per second squared, which is defined to be one newton. Now, for the record, a Newton is about as much as a quarter pounder weighs just before you cook it. So if you take a quarter pound burger, it's still frozen, say, obviously we didn't get it from Wendy's, we had to get it from somewhere else. Uh, but if you take a, a quarter pound burger uh, before it's thawed and before it's cooked, that's roughly 
what a newton is so it's a it's a you know about a quarter pound in other words if i weigh 250 my mat my, my weight would roughly be about a thousand newtons now for the record in the british system and then we have the si system which is what we use uh the unit of mass for the british system is in fact the kilogram and the unit of force which also equals weight in the british system is the newton now in the si system here's the odd part the unit of mass or excuse me i said that backwards ay 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 that's terrible i can't believe i just wrote all that backwards let's kill all this really everybody stop looking quick quick something bad happened i don't know what was going on oh okay let me just erase it be clear okay i wrote british and then filled out the opposite for some reason okay so let's look again i'm going to say mass and i'm going to say force which equals weight just to remind you that there is a difference between weight and mass now the si system the unit is the kilogram the si system the unit is the newton the british system the unit is the slug and the unit is the pound okay and in fact like we said before the acceleration due to gravity uh that's about 32 feet per second per second in the British system and it's 9.80 meters per second per second in here so that's just another thing to keep in mind but that's sort of where we are as far as the units and stuff goes regarding uh the stuff so one thing you might want to think about is first off let's imagine an object in free fall That's what we learned about in chapter two and a little bit in chapter three as well. An object in free fall, does anybody know anything about it? Like what's its velocity or what's its acceleration or what forces are acting on it? Its acceleration uh, should be negative 9.8, right, for gravity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it, most people would call down the negative direction, in which case, yeah, you'd say the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second per second. Exactly. Uh, the other thing about that is that only happens if air resistance is zero, right? So what we do in physics, when we try to apply Newton's second law of motion, which is you know really uh, this equation right here, when we apply that, uh, and also by the way, this is Newton's third law, so I'll circle that one. And you could call this essentially Newton's first law if you wanted to put it in your own words or whatever. Uh, when we apply Newton's second law, we generally use something called a free body diagram. Okay. And what that is, is you can imagine, uh, let's take an object and until we get to the section where we deal with torques and stuff like that, we're going to have to assume everything's a point object. So here is a object of mass M. And I'm going to say it's in a coordinate system in which Y is positive pointing down. And let's say X is positive pointing right. That, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is once you've done that, now the Z is, is defined. You have to use the right hand rule like this, where your index finger of your right hand points in the X direction. Your middle finger of your right hand, which is at a 90 degree to your index finger, that points in the Y direction. So you see in this case, the thumb points in the Z direction. The thumb must come out of the page for this diagram. So can anybody tell me what force if any are act is acting on this mass that's in free fall gravity gravity is there a name for that force that we use in everyday language 
you might not recognize it, but it is. Acceleration. Uh, the acceleration is what results from it, but there's a W word that we use. Wait. Wait, there you go. So the force acting on this, if you write down Newton's second law, the summation forces is equal to mass times acceleration. And I use I, I usually don't put the external, but I am today just for the first part. So that, since it's in free fall, that has to be the only force acting on it. Because if it had another force, it would have an acceleration other than G. So the left-hand side of Newton's second law becomes just W, the weight. Okay. Now, the right-hand side of Newton's second law happens to be M times the acceleration. What kind of acceleration do you get when an object's in free fall? Y'all have said it before. A negative uh, acceleration. Exactly. And it's uh, how much? What's the number? Or what's the symbol for the number? G. G. There you go. So it turns out now we have a formula for the weight of an object. If you want to calculate the weight of an object, you take its mass and multiply it by the gravitational acceleration of the planet that it's on. So if we're talking on Earth uh, and my mass is 100 kilograms, then my weight is 980 newtons, roughly. My mass is not 100 kilograms, by the way. It's quite a bit bigger, but still. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you were at the moon, then obviously the biggest source of gravity near you is the moon. Well, the moon has a acceleration due to gravity that's about one sixth that of ours. So uh, my mass would still be 100 kilograms on the moon, but my weight would drop to one sixth of uh, 980 newtons. OK, so that's something key to know. And we've also seen something called a free body diagram. So that brings me to something else that I'd like to show you guys. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away this and I'm going to uh, uh, put a, a mass on a table if I can actually get this to move. OK, so let's imagine a table. Right here. OK. And let's put on it a box whose weight is 100.0 kilograms. That's technically not its weight. That is its mass. Okay. Now, uh, just thinking a little bit here, and let me let me make this a little better. I don't like this. Uh, thinking about this a little bit, if I've got a a mass like a hundred kilogram box sitting on a table. What is its velocity? Zero. Exactly. If we wait a couple seconds, what will its velocity be? Zero. Exactly. And because of that, not because it's velocity zero, but because it's velocity zero, and then it's velocity zero, and then it's velocity zero, because of that, we know I'm writing V equals zero perpetually implies A has got to be zero. Okay. Now, because of that, we are able to say something very specific. Can anybody tell me any forces acting on this box sitting on this table? 980 Newtons downwards. Exactly, the weight. So what we know from our free body diagram, for instance, is that the object whose mass is 100.0 kilograms has a force acting on it that is W, which equals 980 
Uh, I'll go ahead and say 0 0.0 newtons, even though 9.8 really only had three sig figs. Okay, so that force is acting on it. Is this possible according to Newton's first law of motion? Is this really the free body diagram? Yes. No. So that means we should be able to take Newton's second law, which is the summation of the forces. I'm gonna leave off the external this time is equal to M times A. And uh, evidently the left-hand side is 980.0 Newtons. And the right-hand side is zero. Nope. Can't do that, can you? So what are we missing? Is, is there something missing from my free body diagram? Yeah, the force of the table on the weight or on there the mass. Yeah, so just using Newton's second law doesn't tell us this, but using Newton's first law, we remember that, oh, if the object has an accelerate or it has a velocity that's not changing, then the net force acting on it must be zero. So we've now used Newton's first law to make a prediction that there's at least one other force acting on it. And someone said the force of the table, and they're absolutely right. Uh, I'm going to say the force resulting from the table is this, and it's actually called, uh, it has a very specific name. I use the symbol F sub N, but it's called the normal force. And it turns out if you have a vector that is 90 degrees different than another vector, then those vectors are said to be perpendicular. If you have a line that makes a 90 degree angle with another line, they're said to be perpendicular. However, if you have a vector or a line that is at 90 degrees with a surface, that line is said to be normal to the surface. So that's where the word normal comes from. It's just a more formal use of uh, perpendicular, basically. But like I said, it's not uh, mathematically appropriate to use perpendicular. So that's the normal force. And, and this is actually confusing for a lot of people because the table is an inanimate object, yet it's supplying some force, right? Well, if you think about that and if that bothers you, Stop for a second and imagine what would happen if instead of that 100 kilogram block, what would happen if I stuck an elephant on that table? It probably wouldn't hold up, right? So you can see that, yeah, maybe a table does apply a force, but it definitely has some limits to what it could do. Like I could possibly stand on it or I might couldn't. If I stood in the middle of it, I'm liable to fall right through the center if it's got some really crappy particle board, right? So that's another thing. What we've now learned is there exists this quantity called a normal force, and that is a force that comes in handy later. In fact, later we'll discover that the kinetic friction, which is normally indicated by that script F, and sometimes we'll put a subscript K on it, is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction, which is why I got a little K there and some mu times the normal force. So that normal force is something very important. In fact, the static friction, which is the friction that it has uh, when it's when the object and what it's sitting on do not have a relative velocity. So anything sitting on a table, the bottom of the thing does not have a velocity relative to the top of the table. So it's in static equilibrium and it's not moving that static friction force uh, can be no greater than mu static times the normal force. And we have to use that less than because uh, if it was always mu static times the normal force and I put like half that much force on it, if that was an equals instead of a less than, then friction would cause the object to move off to the left, even though I was pushing it to the right. So that doesn't make any sense. So we use a less than symbol. So this normal force is something that's important. Now, 
what does Newton's second law mean? Well, if I write Newton's second law like this, the summation of the forces, and I can put a subscript external here. Again, I'm going to ditch that really soon, uh, but I'm just wanting to remind you an object or whatever you're studying as the system cannot apply a force to itself. What this is equivalent to in two dimensions is the summation of the forces in the X direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the X direction. And the summation forces in the Y direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the Y direction. And of course, if you had a Z direction, you'd have another equation, okay? Now, the beauty of that is once you've got Newton's second law in the form of these two equations here, then the vectors have been rendered as uh, components that are parallel to the x-axis or parallel to the negative x-axis, or for the second case, all the components of the vectors that are parallel to the y-axis are anti-parallel to the y-axis, and they have uh, basically, they behave as positive and negative sign numbers, okay? So that's uh, that's what writing it this way gives you. So when you go to apply Newton's second law, you first draw a free body diagram. So number one, draw a FBD, and that's free body diagram, with coordinates, or I'll say coordinate, well, that was not good. Whoa. See, oh, whoa, might as well go ahead and cord and net axes. Okay. Object right now is a point. Like I said, later we'll study the ability of something to rotate and spin and stuff like that, and it won't be useful for us to call it a point, but that's what we're doing it right now. Two, uh, deconstruct each force into its components relative to the coordinates you or coordinate axes you chose. In other words, once you draw the forces, all the forces acting on the object, you've got to make them useful so that you can use uh, these equations as opposed to this uh, F equals MA equation in vector form, okay? And then three, plug component forces. with their signs into summation forces in the x direction equals mass times acceleration in the x direction, summation forces in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction, dot, dot, dot. Obviously, you really only have one other summation of forces in the z direction, okay? So that's how we're going to actually attack uh, Newton's second law. So with this diagram right here, I can say I have my free body diagram. Both of my vectors are, in fact, parallel to my coordinate axes. So I can write, since they're all in the y direction, I can write this. The summation forces in the y direction 
equals mass times acceleration in y direction. Can anybody tell me, we already figured it out, uh, what the acceleration in the y direction is for that box on the table? Nine point eight. Uh, actually, in this case, remember it's just sitting on the table, and what we've decided was this table or this box was just sitting perfectly still. I said the velocity is perpetually zero. So what that means, and I get what you're saying, that is a, a hard point that students are running into when you first start studying this. You know that gravity's pulling on it with a force equal to mg. And if it wasn't for the table holding up, holding it up, it would be traveling at with an acceleration of G. But the main thing is the acceleration is really uh, the instantaneous rate of change of velocity. In this case, the velocity is zero. It, it's not moving up and down at all. So I know the total force has got to add up to be zero. And because of that, I can now write Newton's second law as follows. Notice the positive force was the W that because I called down the positive Y direction. So I'm going to say 980.0 newtons minus F normal. Notice I put the negative in there because it happens to be pointing in the negative Y direction. That's equal to zero. So now I can solve, and what I find out is that the normal force is equal to 980.0 newtons, which in fact is just equal to m times g. And I'm going to write this because this is very important. Yes, the normal force equals mg this time. Okay, that's not necessarily normally the case. So any questions on that? Does that make sense to everyone? So let's try another Newton second law problem. What I'm gonna do now is I am going to imagine a horizontal surface. I'm going to put a box on it. The box is going to have a mass of 100.0 kilograms. And I'm going to apply a force to it of 200.0 newtons. And that's going to be at 30 degrees above horizontal. This surface is an ice skating rink. Which implies the friction is approximately equal to zero. What I would like to know is what is the acceleration of this block? Okay. So again, like I told you before, we're always going to start with a free body diagram. In this case, I'm going to draw my axes in black. And I'm going to call that way the positive x direction. And I'm going to call this way the positive y direction. And I am going to put my mass right here. Oh, I don't want to do that. I'll put my M equals 100.0 kilograms right there just to let us know what it is. Now, the forces acting on it are, in fact, uh, not really parallel to either coordinate, system, uh, either coordinate axis. So I'm just going to use this random green color and say the force is 200.0 newtons at 30 degrees. The reason I'm using 30 degrees and 200 is because that's very close to a very special triangle, specifically the 60, 30, 90 triangle, 
where this would be the square root of three, this would be one, and this would be two. Okay. So uh, any other forces acting on this block? Big hint, yes. <laughs> Anybody think force of the block? Force? Go ahead. Sorry. The force of the block pushing against the, the ground. And ah, there you go. Yeah. Back up. Gravity's pulling the block down. And then something else is going to be happening as well. Now, that pulling it down mm -hmm. happens to be in a positive direction, uh, or excuse me, in a negative direction. So I'm going to make that vector red since it's already parallel to one of my axes. And that is, in fact, the weight which equals mg, which is going to be 980.0 newtons. So, yeah, absolutely. That's one of the forces acting on it. Uh, so I think you might have been alluding either to that force or you might have been alluding to another force. Does anyone know of another force or a name for it or anything that might be acting on this crate? Normal force? the normal force okay and i'm going to use blue for the negative direction and in fact the normal force would be acting this way like that okay so if there was friction there might be a horizontal force but i'm assuming the friction is zero so we don't have that but we also don't have that green force in any kind of useful way OK, what I really need is uh, that force to be broken down into components that are parallel to the X axis and the Y axis. So uh, blue is our positive direction. So I'm going to say for starters, if I go from the tail of the green vector to right here, then I will get the X component of the vector and that will be 200.0 newtons times the cosine of 30 degrees, I think you can see the square root, or excuse me, the cosine of 30 degrees is the square root of three over two. So uh, the square root of three over two times 200 is gonna be the square root of three times 100, which is about 173. Actually, let me go ahead and check what the square root of three is just to be a little more fancy. 173.2, so I'll say 173.2 Newtons. And that gives me, actually, I can pretend like that angle is 30.0. Uh, I'll do that, and we'll just say everything has three sig figs. Now, I also have a component in the Y direction for the green vector, and that too is pointing in the positive direction. So I'm going to draw that blue as well. And in that case, it's 200.0 newtons times the sine of 30 degrees. And the sine of 30 is one half. So this is 100.0 newtons acting this way. OK. So now I can write. And again, this is my solution. So I'm going to go ahead and write solution. The summation of the forces in the Y direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the Y direction. So can uh, anybody tell me what the acceleration of this crate will be in the Y direction? Zero. Yes. The main thing is you'd probably be pulling it along a smooth ice skating rink and the chances of it bouncing up and down or anything like that is negligible. So we're going to say the acceleration in the Y direction is equal to zero. And now all we do is got to figure out the left hand side, which is all the forces acting in the vertical direction, and they have to add up to give me zero. So what I'm going to do is I see the normal force is acting in the positive direction. So I'll say F normal. I see that the component of the green force in the Y direction is acting upward, and that's 100 newtons. So I'll say plus 100.0 newtons. 
And then I say minus 980.0 newtons, all that equals zero. Okay. So in this case, we can go ahead, since there's only one unknown, we can go ahead and solve for the normal force. And what we'll get is the 980 going to the other side becomes positive, And we end up getting 980 minus 100. So this is 880.0 Newtons is the normal force. So notice in this case, the normal force was in fact not, not, not mg okay and that can be used as an advantage uh if you are actually trying to drag a heavy box say across the floor of home depot if you just push horizontally on it all your force is going into sliding it which might be a good thing but if you can do just a little bit of lift on it then you can decrease the normal force and since i told you the friction forces are proportional to normal forces that means you can lighten the load by decreasing the friction as well so that's a uh, part of it and that was not part we asked for i just wanted to point that out that the normal force is not always mg here's your first case that that's the case now i'm going to have the summation whoa the summation of the forces in the x direction equals mass times acceleration in the x direction. In this case, the acceleration in the x direction is the only acceleration there is. So I really don't need to write it sub x. I'll just call it A. So can anybody tell me what forces are acting in the x direction? Can you say that one more time? Can anybody tell me what forces are acting in the x direction, meaning in the positive or negative x direction? Um, the 200 newtons, the person applying the force? Yeah, so the 200 newtons, uh, that was reduced to two blue vectors. Once you reduce those, then the 200 newtons is out of play, which I, I think you knew. I think you were just trying to point to the x component of it. Uh, but yeah, that's it. It's just the X component of the 200 newtons is the only thing that happens to be in the positive direction. So I'm going to write positive 173.2 newtons is equal to 100.0 kilograms times just plain A. So in fact, A for this is going to be 1.732 meters per second every second and that's the acceleration of this object so that's how newton's second law works again free body diagram make some uh, adjustments to make sure you know what they're talking about in terms of uh, x and y components and then keep on moving on so let's try another one now. Anybody have any questions about that? These are supposed to be very, very simple, but just to get you an idea of what's going on. So does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. What I'm going to do now is I am going I'm to- I'm sorry. Add, yes, um, sir. We were looking for the force. Uh, in this case, I was asking for the acceleration, the little A equals question mark. Okay. But I use the opportunity to teach you that the normal force is not always mg. That's that's why I circled that other part too. So let's imagine now that we have a barge sitting on a frozen canal. This barge has a mass of 1000 kilograms. And then I have some crazy forces acting as such. So I have a 200.0 Newton force acting at 30 degrees. Okay. And I also have a 
force of 141.4 newtons acting at 45 degrees, okay? And there's no friction force. So we're looking at a barge on a frozen canal and we're looking at it from above. So this is a barge on a frozen frictionless canal okay what i want to calculate is what is the acceleration again okay so again i'm going to draw my free body diagram I'm going to make a coordinate axis. I'm going to draw that as the X direction. I'm going to draw that as the Y direction. So whichever side I put the Y on and whichever side I put the X on, generally what I mean by that is I'm saying, hey, this is the positive direction. So even if I don't write positive by it, just know that's why I'm writing it. Uh, I'm going to put the object right here. Uh, we have a force of, in fact, 200 newtons at 30 degrees. And we're always going to assume the degree is the three sig figs. And we have another force at 45 degrees. Again, we'll assume that's that big, and that's 141.4 newtons, okay? So in order for us to do this, we have to have the summation of the forces. So this is our solution again. We have the summation of our forces in the X direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the X direction. And we have our summation of forces in the y direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the y direction. In this case, I can't make any argument that the ay or the ax is going to be zero because I'm just pulling a barge across a fro frozen lake or something, right? I might actually be accidentally pulling it towards one side of the lake or not. I'm not sure. So we have to work with that. So first thing I'm going to do is uh, break down my vectors into their components. I see that the top one, the 200 newtons, has, in fact, since we already worked it out before, it has a vertical component of 100.0 newtons. Notice that's the same force that we did before. And it has a horizontal component, which is also positive. And in this case, this force is 173.2 newtons, okay? Now, we also have a horizontal component of force for the smaller one, and that guy is going to be 100.0 newtons. And I'm carrying one extra sig fig again. And in fact, there also is a negative Y component that is, in fact, 100.0 newtons. Okay. So now I've got all my forces acting in the appropriate direction. So uh, the summation of forces in the X direction, can anybody tell me what all forces I'll put in there? Uh, in the X direction, mm -hmm. two hundred and seventy-three point uh one eight newtons positive. Exactly. Yeah, the one seventy-three point two. So make sure I got the right pin. So this is uh one seventy-three point two newtons, and then plus one hundred point zero newtons. And that's equal to 1,000.0 kilograms 
times a sub x. So you get a sub x is equal to 273.2 newtons divided by 1000.0 kilograms, which gives you 0 0.2732 meters per second every second. So that's how much acceleration it would get from those two forces in the X direction. What okay. happens in the Y direction? What forces what? are acting there? 100 Newtons up and 100 Newtons down, they'll cancel out. Exactly. So you do 100 Newtons minus 100 Newtons is equal to, uh, in this case, it's, again, 1,000 times a sub y, but in this case, you find that a sub y is zero, and that's exactly right, okay? Now, uh, let me show you one more. We only have like four, uh, three or four minutes left. Uh, I wanna show you a quick problem. What I'm gonna do is draw a inclined plane And let's say the angle here is 36.9 degrees, okay? And I am gonna put a box on there. And that box is gonna have a mass of 100.0 kilograms. And I'm gonna say that it's potentially going to slide downward but I am going to put a friction force acting this way, and it's going to be a 5.00 Newton force. That means I got two minutes left, okay? So this one actually has friction. Now, I'm going to draw a free body diagram again. So in this case, I'm going to choose a very odd coordinate system. Okay, that's going to be my y-axis, Whoa, and this is going to be my x-axis, and in fact, I'll put a prime on them since they're curved like that or, or tilted, and what this means is this is 36.9 degrees right there. Now, the mass is this little ball here, and it has acting on it. I'll use green to continue representing vectors that aren't reconnoitered in terms of components. That's going to be 980.0 Newtons downward. Okay. Now I also have acting in the negative direction, a force F equals 5.00 Newtons. But what I've got to do is I've got to use my geometry to figure some stuff out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this to black and I'm gonna try to extend this this way and then try to extend this this way. What I want you to see is right here, that makes this a right triangle, which makes this angle like 53.1 degrees. Well, that's because the green line's vertical and the black line was horizontal, so they're 90 degrees. Well, the x-axis and the y-axis make 90 degrees as well, so that means this angle right here is also 36.9 degrees. So it turns out that there is, in fact, a negative component going this way, And it is, in fact, 980.0 Newtons times cosine 36.9 degrees. And this one's going to be a positive one. And this is going to be 980.0 uh, Newtons times the sine of 36.9 degrees. 
And that's it. That's your summation. Now you can write your summation of forces in the Y direction. I'll finish this up because it's now 540 and I've already heard, uh, or excuse me, uh, 640 and I've already heard a couple people leave, but I'm just going to finish writing this up. You guys are free to go if you want. Uh, I'll wait for the last person to leave uh, before I hang up. So in case you all have any questions. So let me write the summation forces in the X prime direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the X prime direction. Uh, that's actually an acceleration direction that I expect to happen. And in fact, uh, when I multiply 980 times the sine of 36.9, I get 580. 8.4 newtons and when I multiply 980 times cosine 36.9 I get 783.7 newtons okay so the summation of forces in the x direction is going to give me 588.4 newtons minus 5.00 newtons is equal to 100.0 kilograms. And that's going to be my only acceleration. So I'm just going to call it A. And obviously, A turns out to be 583.4 newtons divided by 100.0 kilograms, which gives me 5.83 meters per second every second. Now that means I could ask you, okay, well, if the block started from rest, how long, how fast would it be going after one second? And you'd say 5.83 meters per second. After two seconds, it'd be twice 5.83. Uh, I could even ask you how far it's moved. I'm just telling you all this to keep in mind that kinematics are still in play. Now, the summation of forces in the Y prime direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the Y prime direction. This is the case where we're not expecting the crate to bounce up and down on the incline. So I'm going to go ahead and call A sub Y prime equal to zero. So uh, in this case, we left off one force. I don't know why. I oh, I remember I got sidetracked because of the time. Uh, there's another force here. Anybody recognize what force I left off? Normal force. Exactly. Uh, thank you for keeping me honest there. So there is our normal force. And that's part of the reason that I did this problem is so you'd see that the normal force is, again, not equal to mg. In fact, what we're going to get is F normal is the positive one, minus 783.7 newtons is equal to zero. So we see that the normal force in this case is 783.7 newtons. And in fact, if you look at the way the cosine function goes, from zero to 90 degrees, cosine just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the steeper that angle is, the smaller the normal force is. And this is why you see in snow prone areas, like I was telling my kids, uh, my class earlier today, uh, I went up to Beaverton in Portland, Oregon, and I got to see the house that they filmed The Shining in, or at least the part that they filmed from the outside, which is a ski lodge at the top of the mountain. And the roof was super, super steep. And the reason why is because when it's super, super steep, then a huge snowpack on the roof isn't going to be bothering it very much because that normal force is so small. Okay. That normal force, in fact, if you ignore all the other stuff, is just going to be the weight times cosine of the angle theta. And as the angle gets closer and closer to 90 degrees, the cosine gets closer and closer to zero. So that's why steep roofs are really good in snow prone areas. And in fact, level or even flat roofs are best in, in wind prone, hurricane prone areas. So 
anyways, that's a nice little sidebar. We've now solved yet another Newton second law. I've put some examples in the modules for Canvas. So you've got plenty of examples to look at in terms of uh, how to apply Newton's second law, neat little tricks, mathematical tricks. I'll be doing some more of those, like the fuzzy dice one and uh, the fuzzy dice hanging from a rearview mirror, for instance, and stuff like that. Uh, and there's just a, a way that you set these things up with F equals MA. And then there's some neat little tricks we can use to solve systems of two equations and two unknowns. And that's largely what these examples are about in chapter five and six. So as I told you, I've changed the dates for chapters five and four, I think four, two, and maybe even six. So pay attention to the dates on my lab and mastering, not on the Canvas side. You guys, like I said, are free to go. Uh, anybody have any questions for me? Um, yes, uh, I, you may have mentioned, uh, but I probably didn't catch it. Uh, which chapters is the midterm going to be on? It's normally at least one through six. Sometimes it'll be one through eight. Sometimes it'll be one through seven. Uh, it all depends on how much material we cover. Uh, and I think I looked it up. It's around three, eight, like right after spring break or something that we have it, but it's on the syllabus, whatever date that is, that's the date I'm sticking to. March 1st. What's that? It's oh. March 1st. March 1st. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, anybody else have a question? And we'll, I'll have a practice midterm for you. Actually, I'll probably have two. I'll have one for you to get practiced with Respondus uh, Monitor and Respondus Lockdown Browser. And then I'll have another one that's just uh, the one you're going to take a lot of times to try to get as high a grade as possible because it's going to help you from an extra credit standpoint. You know. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, I emailed you. I don't know if you saw the email. I did. I saw, I saw the email. Uh, in fact, I saw it again this afternoon. I think you emailed me uh, yesterday, didn't you? And then uh, yes, you yes. Another email. Yeah. Uh, you you were having some problems with some assignment or something. Like the grades wasn't coming through or something. I was just, uh, I was asking a grace period for uh, the chapter three uh, homeworks. Oh, you were asking for something about chapter three? Yeah, here, I see it. I think it's too late now, but it's fine. <laughs> okay, gotcha. I, I will send you a response to this. Uh, I think that's something I can work with you on. So let, uh, okay. just pay attention. I'll reply to you. Uh, if I don't reply to you tonight, I'll reply to you first thing in the morning. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Have a good one. Is it Kamna? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Have a good one, Kamna. Sorry, I didn't reply uh, to you yet. I, you uh, were on my list of things to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Christian, bye -bye. Kamna, bye -bye. anybody have questions? Oh, I have one question, real quick. Um, is it possible if you can just quickly go over like the rules of what significant figures are? Because I struggle with those on the test. Gotcha. Okay. So the significant figure rule is kind of weird in that it can be problematic when you're adding. So you got to be careful with adding. Uh, the main thing is when you add two numbers, the number with the least number of decimal places, that dictates what decimal place you have to round the result to. So for instance, if I can write on this particular page right here, if I'm adding, uh, tw let's see, if I add 28.3972 plus 0 0.4, then the one with the least number of decimal places is this guy, okay? So, uh, and I shouldn't really underline that because that underline normally means, hey, this isn't significant. So let me get rid of that, <laughs> okay? So when I add these two, what I'm doing is I'm pretending like there's a zero here, there's a zero here, and there's a zero here. And I'm going two, seven, nine, three plus four is seven, and then 28 like that. 
but now I've got to round this and the answer is going to be 28.8 because that one digit, that one number, the second number only had one decimal place. Therefore, I had to round it to that. That also works kind of oddly if I have, say, 5,250 plus uh, 175.4932. If I add these, uh, this one's ambiguous at best. So uh, really, I should only be saying uh, this is a five, this is a two, uh, and that's a four like that. And in fact, uh, I should probably call this 5.42 or 5.43 times 10 to the third, because technically without a decimal point here, without a decimal point there, I, I'm not really supposed to count that zero as a sig fig. So that's how sig figs work when you're adding and subtracting. When you're multiplying and dividing though, if I do 28.3972, that has six sig figs. And if I multiply this by 0 0.4, that only has one sig fig. So in fact, I have to round the answer to one sig fig. Now, for the record, let me stop sharing this for a second. For the record, let me share. Yeah, let me share this right here. I'm going to do share screen. And I'll do that. Okay. Uh, if you look on my channel. You can do a search down here for SIG. And you see this right here is a full description of sig fig, scientific notation, and that sort of stuff. Yes, I under, we um I understand sig figs is just um I get kind of confused because in IB they just say use three sig figs for every calculation. So, yeah, uh, I, and I'm not going, I mean, other than the one question where I ask you specifically, or the couple of questions where I specifically ask you, how many sig figs do you have when you add these two numbers, or how many sig figs when you multiply these two numbers? Other than those questions, I'm not going to care about sig figs at all in the lecture. You're supposed to use sig fig rules for a while in the lab, but as the semester progresses, we're going to uh, slowly move you from using sig figs and here's another video on sig figs by the way uh we're going to move you from using sig figs to using propagation of error formulas which is really the appropriate way to deal with it so even sig figs is really that's not really the the holy grail of of doing stuff <laughs> so don't don't fret too bad at least in my class don't fret too bad about sig figs just know that when you add them uh, the one with the least precision, in other words, the one, in other words, the one with the fewest decimal places, decides the number of decimal pl decimal places the answer has. And when you multiply or divide or take the sign of or the logarithm of, basically the number with the least number of sig figs tells you how many sig figs your answer will have. Does that help, Christian? Yes, sir. All right. Well, have a Thank good you. one, Thank and you. I'm going to call it a day and go polish my dome. Thank you. <laughs> have a good one, buddy. And then I have a lap to attend in about 20 minutes. Have a good one, sir. <laughs> you too. Thank you. <laughs>